What drives you to put effort into making sure that the 448 aren't forgotten in England? I was here as a child during the war. I was nine years old when the 448s actually arrived up the airfield. It was only just to, about a mile and a quarter away from my home. And you, you must remember that we'd been at war since 1939. Everywhere was drab and, and you know, we were on rations. My dad was away in the RAF and um, suddenly they were building an airfield. And then um, we heard their Americans were coming. And uh, the impact that had, I mean, there would be, I suppose, were just over 300, 350 people living in Seething at that time. And suddenly to have 3,000 young Americans just down the road, you can imagine the impact it had here. And uh, the first thing I noticed, uh, you know, we that impacted on us was um, the aircraft. When they arrived in November 1943, you can't believe how huge they were and the sound they made. And at night time, sound travels. So you would lay awake and the first thing we heard was the, the, the noise. The putt-putt engines would start up on the airfield and then start up the four Pratt & Whitney um, engines and uh, then there would be this n terrible noise you know as they were taking off um, to go off to war and then then um, the only way they had to get around the villages were on bicycles and they would always be remember all the signposts had been taken down so that it was to confuse the enemy but confused everybody else so they would come and stop you and ask you you know um, can you tell us where the nearest pub is and um, sometimes would ask you if you've got a big sister at home. But, um, I mean, I was nine years old. All we knew about America, remember, uh, although we lived in a, a really modern house, there was no electricity and there was no water. And uh, so, you know, we, 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 we didn't have much. And so we didn't know much about America. There was a few lessons at school, geography lessons, and perhaps some um, comics or something like that, but no one knew anything about it. All I knew about America was um, Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn books because um, I was very shy and um, I just loved reading. I would get my head in the books when I could get them. Um, there was no libraries, nothing. You never hardly left your own village. And, um, I mean, children nowadays have got no idea. There's, there's no television. The only radio you had was with a, with a battery, and so... You know, we we were really the impact that would never have an impact now, like it did in those days, and they were so friendly. And then suddenly, um, we got uh, still in that November, our, our school. It was a it's a clay lump school with a thatched roof, all very primitive, and there was lots of us children there. And uh, and then we had to have all the evacuees that came from London and trying to to get uh, enough. Um, desks and everything in and supplies to for all of them but we got an invitation some Americans came and invited us the school up to the um, base for a party and what it was that was Thanksgiving in 1943 just when they didn't arrived they hadn't been there long at all in fact um, the air crews arrived uh, on the day when we first went up there the ground crew had been here since about August, September and they were the ones who had to work to get the base ready because when they when they came over actually the, they were still building the runways and so that they, they invited us up there and I can still remember standing outside our school uh, waiting and seeing these canvas covers trucks coming up and the excitement of being lifted up to the back and uh, and uh, being taken up there but I had a younger brother and he'd only then started school and so uh, rations, uh, clothing rations was very um, sort of scarce and, uh, and my brother was losing everything and so I was instilled by my mum to look after Reggie and make sure he doesn't lose that overcoat because he'll never have another one and so there was me sort of chewing my fingernails and hoping he didn't lose it and as soon as we got there they took all our coats and um, to put them away somewhere so we didn't see them anymore but there wasn't enough children to go round all the questions I wanted to ask 
you know, I was going to ask so many questions about America when I sat at this long table with all these Americans who wanted to ask me questions. In the end, I think all I told them was my name and said, yes, please, and no, thank you. And I, I never did get to ask a question, which uh, I was, you know, was able to do later on. But um, they they were always riding around. They They brought supplies to the school. They gave concerts in the in the chapel and uh, in the school they came and um, and they, they were doing so many good things and um, although I didn't have a big sister at home where I lived there was a few big sisters so we used to have quite a lot of Americans come down our road and some of them were actually um, flying so when they came back from a mission they would um, um, sort of come and flow low and sort of waggle their wings to let them know that um, they were safely home but uh, that that that's that was the first impact I had of them, but then they they came and uh, the ground crews mainly um, got more connected with the local people and um, they they used to go and um, and um, go into homes and be sort of more as adopted because some of them lied about their age and they weren't even old enough to be over here. A lot of the pilots flying were not even old enough to drive a car in America. And um, some of them tried to pretend they were older than what they were, so the crew didn't realise that that they were uh, they were only just twenty. And uh, and um, if if you were in your late twenties, you were known as the old man on the crew. So that um, and then because then we've been at war, we were used to planes, um, so we had the the RAF going over top because we're on the way to the coast, going over top. Um, um, flying their daylight raids, their nighttime raids, they would be then coming home. But in between, uh, the German um, planes would be coming, and you would know because um, their engines were not synchronised properly, so there was a, a missing beat. And even before the air raid sirens went, you would have, um, you would know that the, the Germans were coming, and they bombed around, they bombed around the airfield. And from my bedroom window, I used to be able to see Norwich burning as they bombed that. And, I mean, you see, uh, I was five in, when I, I went to school in September uh, 1939, and that was the, the month that war was declared. So you grow up and you, you don't know any different. So, you know, you, you, you became used to it. So I can't say... I was absolutely terrified, but um, sometimes um, that was bad. But um, I, I remember, you know, them being strafed up the airfield, and the only lights you saw at night would be the searchlights crisscrossing, trying to find them, or the flashes of the ATGAC guns going off, and they, that would be the only lights that were allowed to be shown. But uh, on April the 22nd, um, 1944, it was the, the night that the, the actual um, Germans followed them back home. They were briefed to go uh, fly on this mission that day and then they were recalled because the weather was too bad over the target area. And uh, then they were recalled after lunch and they didn't take off till about four o'clock. And uh, as they were coming back, uh, that was dark and the German fighter planes got in, in among them. And my dad happened to be home on leave at that time and there was all these guns firing all around everywhere. They were on the tracer bullets and bullets were going off and we saw fires up the airfield and that made a big impact on us and uh, and uh, you know you, you know, for a child that's something that stays with you and the more I learnt about um, what happened and by different people, um, because with mum was on her own with just us two. My brother was only born 1938, so he was young, and she had had us. And you had to grow your own, so we were busy working all the time. But there was always um, young Americans stopping and talking to you, and uh, and they were they were so friendly. Uh, That's what we couldn't get over. I mean, they were so pleased to talk to us. A lot of them had left brothers and sisters behind. We used to go up to the airfield, uh, to the, just to the borders of the airfield at the weekend, 
as girls, we had to have somebody else go with us, you know, somebody older. We weren't allowed to, to go around um, so much on our own. And they would come to see you and uh, talk to you. And my favourite thing was getting the comic strips out of their newspapers. I grew up knowing more about Little Abner and all that type of thing than I did anything else. But the impact they they had on me, and I can I can remember only too well uh, when it was um, VE day, and um, we were up the bedroom window and seeing all these. I remember we we'd been in darkness, and suddenly all these brightly coloured flares and rockets going off. I mean, we, we didn't really ever have fireworks because we weren't old enough before the war started. And um, my mother explained to me that was the Americans and they were celebrating because it was VE Day and they were going to go home. And I sat up my bedroom window and I cried. Although my dad was in Europe with the RAF, I didn't want them to go. And, um, and after they went, the impact w was awful. I mean, everything was so quiet and drab and I, I got so hungry to hear these American voices I used to listen to uh, American um, Air Force in Europe um, radio programs, you know, just to sort of um, try and sort of catch up with it. And um, we couldn't go on the airfield for many years because it was used to store bombs and ammunition. But uh, once I was able to go up there, the, because up there uh, that land is suitable for cowslips, and I went up one spring on my own um, to gather cowslips. And when I got up there, all the runways were stretching out in the distance. The buildings were there with their doors and things rattling. And never has anywhere, it's hard to explain, but never has anywhere been so empty and desolate, but so charged up with all that had happened. I could see in my mind's eye when we saw one time a plane that was landing, which was damaged and come careering across the grass and all the things that had happened. And I stood there in my soppy sort of memories and said um, I'm never going to forget you and I'll try and help other people to remember but life went on I was courting and I got married and um, I had my own children and I didn't see any Americans you would hear that perhaps um, one of them had come you know to because several of them had got married to local girls and I know someone had asked where the nearest pub was but we never got to see them then in 1984, we heard they were coming back to actually um, dedicate uh, memorials, one in the churchyard and one on the airfield. And I thought, this is the time for me to ask all those questions I want to ask. And But unfortunately, fate played a hand. And two and a half weeks before they were due, and I'd been helping to organise and get funds, we were having a big reception in the village and up the airfield. But before that, um, my mother and my brother were killed outright in a car accident um, in the next village and so I had to arrange a double funeral and um, just before they they came so I never did ask those questions uh, but um, luckily uh, I managed to get um, the addresses of some of the people who'd um, um, paid money to have the memorials done, the Americans and so I started in 1984, I started writing to them. Uh, no one was more ill-equipped. I, I couldn't type. I hated writing letters. I didn't have any money. I had no idea how to do things, but I knew what I wanted to do. And I started writing to them on this, on this uh, blue airmail um, paper, uh, letters asking you know, about their time here, uh, how, what they thought of it, and just a general thing. And I, I posted off about 50 letters and waited and waited and waited and nothing happened. Then suddenly one day the postman brought an A4 envelope with um, World War II photographs and um, saying, you know, how pleased they were. And that's how it started off. There was many times when I thought, oh, that's no good, they don't want want um, to know and you had to try and convince them that although you were a, a woman um, you you knew what you wanted to do and uh, and I remember one time when I was quite low I suddenly got a letter from this man 
and he said, you never know what your letter meant to me. Um, I'd never talked about my wartime days, and no one knew, and I didn't think anyone was interested. And suddenly to find out that um, we hadn't been forgotten, and I walked to my office with my head held high, and I actually told the, all who I was working with all about my wartime, and I can't wait to come over. And then that makes you think, well, this is what I'm doing it for. And I've been so lucky that I've met hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of the, the veterans. They, we've had um, six big reunions over here, and I've been to America to reunions over there, and I've stayed with some of them in their homes, and, uh, and I've helped lots of families find out about their, their families. And it's been a, a roller coaster. But I've now got um, dozens and dozens and dozens of albums of personal stories and wartime diaries and photographs. And, um, and I think I'm some of the way trying to ensure that their memory you know, carries on. But um, this was in 1984 when I started. And then in 1985, they suddenly dis started to think the Americans said the control tower was in a dreadful state and really derelict. And they thought that'd be nice if it could be tidied up, so when they come over, that you know that would be um, much better. And so the first restoration started, and my husband Ron was involved with it, and um, and because I joined and took my things in, so I was part of the original committee that um, started up the, the the control tower in 1987, and and uh, and I've been in, involved ever since, and it's 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 been. Uh, a real roller coaster, but seeing, I mean, the facelifts that control towers had, I wish I'd had as many. And, uh, you know, that, that, that that's great just to see it grow and to see the interest and the tears in their eyes, you know, when they come, especially the veterans. And I think what, what I found hard was uh, one day I had um, a family come um, and a veteran and I were talking up in my room in the control tower and um, he was talking about his missions and I was, because I knew, you know, done research and knew what he was doing. And so he was telling me all about it. And the family stood the other side of the room with their jaws nearly open. And afterwards, um, they said to me, um, he's never once spoke about it, not since the war. And uh, But when I said uh, mentioned it to him, he said they never once asked. And I felt like bashing heads together because while even now you can especially now with the internet, people can do it so much easier than... I had to get everything from America. There was nothing in this country at all about um, the seething base or the men or anything. So I had to get all the records and everything. I had to get them all from America. And, and that's by post, not not by internet and all that kind of thing. And uh, yes, you can give them the records, but you can't give them their personal experiences. So, you know, uh, they're so vital even now for everyone to just to tell everyone, you know, what's happened in their families. Because people, there's now the, the grandchildren and everything, who are, who are all now trying to find out what happened. A lot of them don't know till they clear the houses of their elderly relatives and find out they were in the war, even. They didn't have heaters in the plane. How did they keep warm? How did they keep warm? Yeah. Um, well, when, when they first come... They have a bunk, and they have three straw square pads. And um, the ground crew soon realised that uh, the only thing to do was to stick them together, because if you turned over, this icy blast came up uh, underneath. So they used to have to do that. And they only had um, blankets. They didn't have any sheets or anything like that. And uh, so they were cold. Their food was rationed. They only had one lot of food a week. And uh, they had one pot-bellied stove in, in the hut. They used to go out and scavenge um, wood or anything. And then um, very often they had coke, which is not very good um, to, to keep alight. And um, some of them rigged up um, things with which dripped oil in. And they had, to, they had to be very careful because they used to get up to all kinds of things to try and keep warm. Um, but the regular thing used to used to go out when it was dark and go to the to where the um, cookhouse was because they used to have coal there and sort of borrow some coal to take back. 
but they used to cut down all sorts of things and then one day the brigadier who was um, owned the estate nearby came up on his white charger and came to complain because they were cutting down all his fences and everything and uh, and asked for them not to carry on doing that but so they had they did have real problems remember there's just one sheet of um, galvanoids between them and the outside they arrived in November when it was cold and wet in fact some of them said they didn't think it ever stopped raining um, for, you know for weeks after they got there but the winter of um, 1944-45 was the coldest winter we'd had for 50 years and um, during the Battle of the Bulge they couldn't take off for at least two weeks because there's none of these snow blowing things then most of it was digging it out and uh, you know they just couldn't take off so they had great great problems coping with the cold and uh, used to pile stuff as much as they could on top of each other uh, all the clues and everything they got there was quite a funny case of one of them that they came uh, somebody had from from their barracks had been um, they wanted him to go up because if somebody was ill they'd suddenly come and get someone a navigator or somebody else to go and they came in and they they called him and uh, he wasn't there and they looked everywhere for him couldn't find him it wasn't until a few hours later that they realized he was thin and he was he was actually um asleep under all the blankets and everything on the bed they couldn't didn't even see it and know he was there so but um, they did have great problems with the cold If you want to know what else they amused themselves with, I think was another question. Yeah, that was it. Uh, they look quite happy in their photos that I've seen. Yeah. How did they keep their spirits up? How do they keep their spirits up? They they actually um, had passes to go into Norwich, where they'd go to the Samson and Hercules and different things. They they would have they would have a truck that would pick them up and take them to Norwich, and they get to Norwich and they'd be black out. And they used to be where the old cattle market was in Norwich, which was nothing but railings, pitch dark, no no street lights. And some of them said they didn't think they were ever going to find anywhere. They just all they did was walk into railings. But they used to go there. But they used to have a, a, a theatre on the base, and they would have regularly have films there. They played um, American football. They played baseball. They had uh, a gym where they, they did um, lots of things then. And there was even educational things if they wanted. But their main thing was um, getting on their bicycles and going to the nearest pub, which were the only... Some places were lucky and had a village hall, but they were the only places where there was entertainment. And they would go there and have a sing-song. And um, they, they regularly told me about... Uh, when they came, how hard they found it to, to drink all this warm um, beer and half and half because they were just used to refrigerated um, uh, um, beer in America. But they soon they soon um, got used to it enough and drink the pubs dry and uh, and fall off their bicycles. And often the sick bay had more people who'd um, fell off their bicycles and had accidents um, from, from going out... Um, w like that and what they did um, from getting injured to start with but um, yes they had they had lots of entertainment and um, the officers used to go by train into London and at, in Norwich um, there is there's a map I can show you and they were given a map for Norwich to show where all the picture houses and all the theatre houses you know theatres were and they'd give one um and where the American Red Cross base was there, so they could go and have a hot shower. It was cold showers, they didn't even have um, hot showers, and they had to. And sometimes they used to put their helmet on top of the stove to put some water in so they could have warm water to have a shave in. And uh, so they used to have maps for that. But the officers very often used to go by train, but most of the uh, the, the ranks used to sort of go uh, sometimes, but there a lot of the time they stayed in this area. But then sometimes, um, if they had a long enough leave, um, they would they would go um, up to Scotland. The officers would, you know, that way they'd get up there. And there was there was whiskey up there. There was steaks up there, and there was no bombs up there. So, because going to London was um, horrendous, really, uh, when the, the bombing and then the V bombs coming. I mean, when they used to come over, we they used to come over us to get to anywhere else. So, we were used to seeing them as well. I mean. 
when you look back, I mean, the, the changes in our life in, in those few years was tremendous. But, uh, yeah, they, you know, they, they, they did their best. A lot of them had troubles. And some of the men never, ever left the base, the ground crew. They, they never left. They, ne they, they stayed on the base all the while, all, all the while they were here. And, I mean, James Hallseason wrote a book called A Thousand Day Battle, which I haven't ever counted it up, but he, he, he estimated it's about a thousand days they were here. Uh, but, um, I mean, they, they, had, they had their problems, terrible problems. The ground crews did too, and they, they were working really hard. And, um, and the air crews, and they never knew when they were going to get called and, um, and volunteered. And, um, I mean, they always told you to never volunteer, but... Um, I mean, like um, Leroy Engdahl, he he volunteered um, so that he could get home quick. But um, and he did. He was the first officer. But there was a uh, one of the the other ranks, and he also um, you know, had the first one. But um, did you hear that um, when when he landed, they were waiting for him, unbeknown to him. Um, they were waiting for him and the commanding officer and all of them and when they stripped him outside the aircraft of all his flying gear they dressed him up in red white and blue pajamas or pjs as they called him they put a top hat on him they gave him a bottle of whiskey and they hung a great big cardboard um, uh, medal round his neck and they paraded him round the base because they'd lost so many men uh, from when when they were, were were first here because they didn't have fight to cover they didn't have fight to cover then as soon as the fighters got to the got them as far as the enemy coast and uh, they they didn't have enough petrol to go any further so they they lost a tremendous amount of people i was looking up um, the april the 22nd one i mean so many of the original um, crew members were there uh, were already shot down and either well they were either dead or prisoners of war and um you know, the, I mean, the, there was a tremendous loss of life just in that time. The first ones were actually ground crew. Um, they were getting the base ready. This was in December the 10th. And um, they were getting the base ready. And uh, and we'd gone back um, to the barracks in their truck, uh, sitting in the back. And um, the truck pulled off the to get to the side a, a B-24 Liberator when they're taxing um, the pilot and co-pilot can't see a thing in front of them they generally have somebody looking out and um, the, there was nothing but mud a newly bay, you know, built place and when they pulled to the side they got stuck in the mud and unbeknown to these ground crews sitting there talking in the back um, a suddenly propellers came through the top and and decapitated one of them and killed another one and badly injured other ones, and they were the first ones who uh, who were killed on the, on the base. Uh, so you know, life was life was not good, but they did the best they could and they were young, and um, when you're young you think you're invincible. I know that the men held parties at the base. Did you go to them and what were they like if you did? Well, that was the one I went to. Uh, I didn't go. They they gave lots of ones afterwards, but we never got invited to any more. I just went to that one I was telling you about, um, where we went up um, for Thanksgiving, and I mean that, I mean we, the rations what they gave us, none of us knew anything about it. That was all American food, even the gravy was not uh, coloured like ours. Um, there was all vegetables. There was sweet corn. Well, I mean, we only ever used corn to feed the chickens with, and um, there was sweet corn, and um, and cornbread stuffing, and turkey. We'd never had turkey before. You were lucky if you, uh, which is different from now, but you were lucky if you had a chicken at Christmas, and that was the only time you normally had chicken. I mean, you'd fat that up down the bottom of the garden, so you had a chicken for Christmas. But then suddenly they put all jam on it, and we couldn't think whatever they were doing, because nobody in this country until then had ever heard of cranberry sauce. Uh, that, that was an, one of the new things that we we learned from America, and um, uh, you know that. But later on, uh, they got organised, and they used to send trucks around to all the local schools, to the 
and pick up evacuees from children from children's homes and bring them out to base uh, to the base. They also used to send trucks all around uh, um, to the villages to pick up the young ladies and bring them up to dances on the base. They had their own dance band here, which um, um, they used to have dances up here and um, and used to go round and um, play at um, village halls and things like that for dancers. They were quite keen on dancing. Some of them can remember doing a lot of the old English dances. He said, I can't remember the name of it, but I know that was something to do with Polly. And you put your your arm in and your arm out. And he still remember that um, the, these ladies used to, to to get them to come up and dance. He said, otherwise we'd have still been sitting there. We used to have a lot of fun, you know. And that was that was a kind of live for today because no one knew whether whether they were going to be there the next next day life was short and people made the most of it i can i can i can tell you but i can tell you this off offline if you like um i i dug out the records first of february 1945 and it, it was um the kind of things they had on. They had. They used to have a religious service, Protestant, Catholic, a Jewish service. They had movies. Today's the last for the last time. It's Holiday Inn with Bing Crosby, and Friday and Saturday they had um, Dragon Seed with Catherine Hepburn, and they have had a library, and uh, they had gifts and and post was collected, and uh, they they they. They used to used to go to uh, Norwich, and uh, used to have regular things to go there. And um, this is a, an original um, um, program from a Christmas Day football um, game that was held at, at Carrow Road in Norwich. And um, so you know, they the things were organised for them everywhere, and in in Norwich actually, or just outside Norwich. Um, they even had a, a, a bunk, uh, a house where and um, boats were provided for them to go uh, sailing on the broads. And some of them, I've got pictures of some of them. They were playing golf at uh, with some of the people at golf courses, and they in they were, you know, they got um, involved with with all manners. They took rations to the um, Jenny Lind Children's Hospital. And they used to go round with their choir and sing um, all over Christmas time. And um, I mean, if anyone used to go and stay with anybody locally, you might have to chop this about. If anyone went to stay with somebody locally, um, they would be given rations because there is a booklet out and that gives them all instructions on what to, to do and what not. And the differences in our languages, because what things means in one uh, is different in another, and um, they they would be given these tins to take to help with the because they said you'll go to a a, a village home and they will um, well then ask you um, you know for a meal and they most probably give you nearly all their month's supply of food because everything was so rationed. Uh, um, but they would be given these tins and, and and I've had some funny stories from local people they didn't know what the codes were on them and they thought they were going to open a tin of peaches and that would be a, perhaps a huge great big tin of baked beans and things like that but they used to used to bring rations round remember the only thing that wasn't rationed were fish and chips and so they got quite used to having fish and chips and when we had one of our big reunions up here I, I used to help arrange them and, and do everything and um, they were having two meals up the airfield and I'd organised all these big marquees and everything and, and I'd organised fish and chips for them um, at Porin and Shop and they brought them over in, he, you know, in these containers keeping them hot because in America they didn't use vinegar you know and uh, so they had to but do you know what the complaint was? Where are the newspapers? Because uh, then there would be one tiny piece of um, grease of paper and then they'd all be wrapped up in the newspapers. And that way they used to like to read all the news in the newspapers. <laughs> but uh, fish and chips, otherwise everything was rationed. So that, that used to be very hard for everybody. What are the highs and lows of the work you do for the 448 and the control tower? Um, the highs are... Was it, were, in the first original days and years, 
was meeting the the actual veterans and talking to them and their families and um, spending time with some of them in America in their own homes so I got to see the real America uh, none of this Disneyland I didn't want to do anything like that I just wanted to see the real America and I, ate, I had the food that um, Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn used to have from my childhood memories and they were the high ones the, the lows are when things haven't gone right and um, and then losing them as one by one they're, they're dying and now I don't think there's any left now and, and that's a sad thing um, there's so many memories uh, there was three people uh, there was myself who was writing to all the Americans and getting their records, their stories, their photos. There was Tom Britton, who was the expert um, with B-24s. Um, he was married to a French lady, so when he retired, he went to France. And so I was able to pass on to him all the information uh, that I got from them about the B-24s. And then there was Jan Hay. He's the, the top expert. Um, and he, 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 he got awards from this country and everything and with, all over the show. He, he's the one who um, actually did all the investigations into the, the crashes and the people who died. His casualty reports are the top things. And so there was the three of us working together, exchanging information and I was keeping them up to date with everything that I got. And uh, so and then, of course, then um, there was... Uh, organising so many people to make film promises 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 and, uh, and that never got made into a, a full-length film at all uh, I worked hard on one of them getting all these people organised over here people who went to the dancers on the base children and um, you know all, some of them who had them come into their houses their families and uh, that was all organised and I, I went organised it in America so uh, they were all going to be interviewed there but um, on that particular day for a reunion they have about three days some of them had travelled thousands of miles to get there and um, and they spent one whole day around this hotel waiting um, to be filmed and and because it wasn't soundproof they had to keep being stopped because the sirens going off and everything like that and then some of them gave up a whole day and never got interviewed that was a bit of a down down thing but um it, it's been on on average it's, it's been brilliant and you know to be able to have people come up there who don't know anything about it the, the americans particularly and they have no idea and i can actually tell them tell them the planes their their grandfathers or fathers or great uncles or ever flew on uh, that that's that's been the high point of it and um, the down point is uh, I'm old and I can't do it anymore and I can't carry on and I can't handle quite so much of all this high-tech things um, as, as what I did and uh, and um, the low point is I've got to hand it over to other people uh, and, and and I know this you know Richard uh, I'm the past and Richard is the present. Uh, he's, he's the new chairman and I'm hoping and wishing him all the best of luck to carry on um, you know, what I've... And, and the whole team, that's not me, there's a whole team of people. There's, I think, uh, I don't know whether you're, uh, Richard is the sixth or seventh chairman and a lot of them have died or moved on to other things. And um, there's a whole team of people been involved it, it takes it, I mean, to get the control to, to what it is now, to what it was when it was first done, just empty rooms, nothing in it, no money to do anything. And um, so, that, you know, that's the highs and that's the lows.